the Stoics, we are told, reckoned that there were eight parts of the soul. These were the five senses, the organ of sound, the intellect, and the reproductive principle. The passions, it will be observed, are conspicuous by their absence. For the Stoic theory was that the passions were simply the intellect, in a diseased state, owing to the perversions of falsehood. This is why the Stoics would not parley with passion, conceiving that, if once it were led into the citadel of the soul, it would supplant the rightful ruler. Passion and reason were not two things which could be kept separate, in which case it might be hoped that reason would control passion, but were two states of the same thing, a worse and a better. The unperturbed intellect was the legitimate monarch in the kingdom of man. Hence the Stoics commonly spoke of it as the leading principle. This was the part of the soul which received fantasies, and it was also that in which impulses were generated, with which we have now more particularly to do. Impulse, or appetition, was the principle in the soul which impelled to action. In an unperverted state, it was directed only to things in accordance with nature. The negative form of this principle, or the avoidance of things as being contrary to nature, we shall call repulsion. Notwithstanding the sublime heights to which Stoic morality rose, it was professedly based on self-love, wherein the Stoics were at one with the other schools of thought in the ancient world. The earliest impulse that appeared in a newly born animal was to protect itself and its own constitution, which were conciliated to it by nature. What tended to its survival it sought, what tended to its destruction it shunned. Thus, self-preservation was the first law of life. While man was still in the merely animal stage, and before reason was developed in him, the things that were in accordance with his nature were such as health, strength, good bodily condition, soundness of all the senses, beauty, swiftness. In short, all the qualities that went to make up richness of physical life and that contributed to the vital harmony. These were called the first things in accordance with nature. Their opposites were all contrary to nature, such as sickness, weakness, mutilation. Under the first things in accordance with nature came also the congenital advantages of soul, such as quickness of intelligence, natural ability, industry, application, memory, and the like. It was a question whether pleasure was to be included among the number. Some members of the school evidently thought that it might be, but the orthodox opinion was that pleasure was a sort of aftergrowth, and that the direct pursuit of it was deleterious to the organism. The aftergrowths of virtue were joy, cheerfulness, and the like. These were the gambolings of the spirit, like the frolicsomeness of an animal in the full flesh of its vitality, or like the blooming of a plant. For one in the same power manifested itself in all ranks of nature, only at each stage on a higher level. To the vegetative powers of the plant, the animal added sense and impulse. It was in accordance, therefore, with the nature of an animal to obey the impulses of sense. But to sense and impulse, man superadded reason, so that, when he became conscious of himself as a rational being, it was in accordance with his nature to let all his impulses be shaped by this new and master hand. Virtue was, therefore, preeminently in accordance with nature. What, then, we must now ask, is the relation of reason to impulse, as conceived by the Stoics? Is reason simply the guiding, and impulse the motive power? Seneca protests against this view, when impulse is identified with passion. One of his grounds for doing so is that reason would be put on a level with passion, if the two were equally necessary for action. But the question is begged by the use of the word passion, which was defined by the Stoics as an excessive impulse. Is it possible, then, even on Stoic principles, for reason to work without something different from itself to help it? Or must we say that reason is itself a principle of action? Here Plutarch comes to our aid, who tells us, on the authority of Chrysippus, in his work on law, that impulse is the reason of man commanding him to act and similarly that repulsion is prohibitive reason. This renders the Stoic position unmistakable, and we must accommodate our minds to it in spite of its difficulties. 
just as we have seen already that reason is not something radically different from sense, so now it appears that reason is not different from impulse, but itself the perfected form of impulse. Whenever impulse is not identical with reason, at least in a rational being, it is not truly impulse, but passion. The Stoics, it will be observed, were evolutionists in their psychology, but, like many evolutionists at the present day, they did not believe in the origin of mind out of matter. In all living things, there existed already what they called seminal reasons, which accounted for the intelligence displayed by plants as well as by animals. As there were four cardinal virtues, so there were four primary passions. These were delight, grief, desire, and fear. All of them were excited by the presence or the prospect of fancied good or ill. What prompted desire by its prospect caused delight by its presence, and what prompted fear by its prospect caused grief by its presence. Thus two of the primary passions had to do with good, and two with evil. All were furies which infested the life of fools, rendering it bitter and grievous to them, and it was the business of philosophy to fight against them. Nor was this strife a hopeless one, since the passions were not grounded in nature, but were due to false opinion. They originated in voluntary judgments, and owed their birth to a lack of mental sobriety. If men wished to live the span of life that was allotted to them, in quietness and peace, they must by all means keep clear of the passions. The four primary passions having been formulated, it became necessary to justify the division by arranging the specific forms of feeling under these four heads. In this task the Stoics displayed a subtlety which is of more interest to the lexicographer than to the student of philosophy. They laid great stress on the derivation of words as affording a clue to their meaning, and as their etymology was bound by no principles, their ingenuity was free to indulge in the wildest freaks of fancy. Though all passion stood self-condemned, there were nevertheless certain eupathies, or happy affections, which would be experienced by the ideally good and wise man. These were not perturbations of the soul, but rather constancies. They were not opposed to reason, but were rather part of reason. Though the sage would never be transported with delight, he would still feel an abiding joy in the presence of the true and only good. He would never indeed be agitated by desire, but still he would be animated by wish, for that was directed only to the good. And, though he would never feel fear, still he would be actuated in danger by a proper caution. There was, therefore, something rational corresponding to three out of the four primary passions, Against delight was to be set joy, against desire, wish, against fear, caution. But against grief there was nothing to be set, for that arose from the presence of ill, which would never attach to the sage. Grief was the irrational conviction that one ought to afflict oneself, where there was no occasion for it. The ideal of the Stoics was the unclouded serenity of Socrates, of whom Xanthippe declared that he had always the same face, whether on leaving the house in the morning or on returning to it at night. As the motley crowd of passions followed the banners of their four leaders, so specific forms of feeling sanctioned by reason were severally assigned to the three eupathies. Things were divided by Zeno into good, bad, and indifferent. To good belonged virtue, and what partook of virtue, to bad, vice, and what partook of vice. All other things were indifferent. To the third class, then, belong such things as life and death, health and sickness, pleasure and pain, beauty and ugliness, strength and weakness, honor and dishonor, wealth and poverty, victory and defeat, nobility and baseness of birth. Good was defined as that which benefits, to confer benefit was no less essential to good than to impart warmth was to heat. If one asked in what to benefit lay, one received the reply that it lay in producing an act or state in accordance with virtue, and similarly it was laid down that to hurt lay in producing an act or state in accordance with vice. 
the indifference of things other than virtue and vice was apparent from the definition of good, which made it essentially beneficial. Such things as health and wealth might be beneficial or not, according to circumstances. They were, therefore, no more good than bad. Again, nothing could be really good, of which the good or ill depended on the use made of it, but this was the case with things like health and wealth. Good having been identified with virtue, there could be no question of any conflict between the right and the expedient. This was a point on which the Stoic doctrine was very explicit. The good was expedient, and fitting, and profitable, and useful, and serviceable, and beautiful, and beneficial, and choice-worthy, and just. These various predicates were defined, generally in accordance with their etymology, in such a way as to avoid the charge of one being a mere synonym of the other. Their contraries were all applicable to the bad. The true and only good, then, was identical with what the Greeks called the beautiful, and what we call the right. To say that a thing was right was to say that it was good, and conversely, to say that it was good was to say that it was right. This absolute identity between the good and right, and on the other hand between the bad and wrong, was the head and front of the Stoic ethics. The right contained in itself all that was necessary for the happy life. The wrong was the only evil, and made men miserable, whether they knew it or not. As virtue was itself the end, it was, of course, choice-worthy in and for itself, apart from hope or fear with regard to its consequences. Moreover, as being the highest good, it could admit of no increase from the addition of things indifferent. It did not even admit of increase from the prolongation of its own existence, for the question was not one of quantity, but of quality. Virtue for an eternity was no more virtue, and therefore no more good, than virtue for a moment. Even so, one circle was no more round than another, whatever you might choose to make its diameter, nor would it detract from the perfection of a circle if it were to be obliterated immediately in the same dust in which it had been drawn. To say that the good of men lay in virtue was another way of saying that it lay in reason, since virtue was the perfection of reason. As reason was the only thing whereby nature had distinguished man from other creatures, to live the rational life was to follow nature. Nature was at once the law of God and the law for man. For by the nature of anything was meant, not that which we actually find it to be, but that which in the eternal fitness of things it was obviously intended to become. To be happy, then, was to be virtuous. To be virtuous was to be rational. To be rational was to follow nature. And to follow nature was to obey God. Virtue imparted to life that even flow in which Zeno declared happiness to consist. This was attained when one's own genius was in harmony with the will that disposed all things. Virtue, having been purified from all the dross of the emotions, came out as something purely intellectual, so that the Stoics agreed with the Socratic conception that virtue is knowledge. They also took on from Plato the four cardinal virtues of wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice, and defined them as so many branches of knowledge. Against these were set four cardinal vices of folly, intemperance, cowardice, and injustice. Under both the virtues and vices, there was an elaborate classification of specific qualities. But notwithstanding the care with which the Stoics divided and subdivided the virtues, virtue, according to their doctrine, was all the time one and indivisible. For virtue was simply reason, and reason, if it were there, must control every department of conduct alike. He who has one virtue has all was a paradox with which Greek thought was already familiar. But Chrysippus went beyond this, declaring that he who displayed one virtue did thereby display all. Neither was the man perfect who did not possess all the virtues, nor was the act perfect which did not involve them all. Where the virtues differed from one another was merely in the order in which they put things. Each was primarily itself, 
secondarily all the rest. 